uh, they go into their ecstasy or their trance state uh, quickly and easily and deeply and they're able to move along the axis, along uh, the world tree, are you familiar with the world tree? Uh, in in a, lot of, a lot of places if you go to shops you'll see trees and they'll show the roots and they'll show the trunk and they'll show the leaves and that is a symbol of shamanism. Uh, the shaman is the one who was able to traverse the vortex or the axis and go into heaven or go down into the roots, go down into hell and do their, do their work. They will usher a soul to heaven or retrieve a soul from hell. That's roughly what a shaman does. Stout, tens of thousands of years old, um, harder than what everybody I've read says that it started tens of thousands of years ago from Siberian branch, went all over every place, down into the, uh, um, the Asian continent, uh, west into Europe, uh, down into uh, Africa, uh, and across the, uh, the Barren Sea, and all of the Native Americans, all are shamanistic. They're exclusively shamanistic. Um, and so you have the animism that moved into shamanism. Um, now one of the things I'm, I'm working on, I just had to revise a chapter, uh, today on Santa Maria. I put a great deal of attention in, into Santa Maria. Uh, and there you find shamanism there too. Uh, it's a shamanism that originated in West Africa. Um, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, and so on. And when the slaves were brought, those, those people were, those West Africans, uh, mainly from the tribe of uh, the Yoruba, were brought to the uh, Caribbean area. They brought the worship of the Orishas with them. I just have to ask the question, how many are aware of this? And I don't want to be talking about stuff you already know. Are you aware of that history? Um, that's literally what happened. Um, uh, and it lodged there, and what, what, what the West Africans found there was Roman Catholicism. And so what they did was, they didn't synchronize, it wasn't a case of synchronization. What they did is they hid the worship of the Orishas in the saint. Santeria means that saint thing. And so you had the worship of the Orishas. You ever heard of Yamaya? Chango? Some of, the, uh, some of the gods of the, the Orishas. In West Africa, there's a couple thousand of them. Um, it looks like they brought about 401 to, uh, to the New World. But when you get right down to it, only about 16 or 17 are actually worshipped in the New World. One of them is called Santa Barbara. Well, that's, Santa Barbara is actually Yamaya. Um, Santa Barbara is the... Um, the, the name it was given to hide Yamaya uh, into the Catholic thing. And what they did to all of the saints, uh, it was perfect for, for that because it just, it just fit. They just took the Orisha, God's, that, the name O-R-I-S, O-R-I-S-H-A, they were called Orisha, they were gods and goddesses. And in the New World, they just gave them new names to hide it. And they developed a whole, a whole structure. Uh, they developed the um, Padrino and the Madrino, the Godfather and the Godmother. And they gave them uh, other names like Santero <coughs> would be the priest, and the Santero are the priestess. And they developed what are called houses or temples. And they had their, their little community. It kept the worship of the Orishas alive. Um, it lodged most deeply in Cuba. Um, right now in Brazil. Um, Brazil has uh, people that are worshiping 
Santeria, but of a different name, Macumba and Candoble, 180 million worshippers of the Orisha gods. That's a lot of people. Uh, very large in Venezuela, uh, Dominican Republic. It's known in Haiti as voodoo. Voodoo or voodoo, there's several pronunciations, it's the same thing. It's just Santeria in Haiti. So it's ubiquitous. Uh, it's all over America. Um, I got a call yesterday morning from a fellow who read some of the stuff I've written uh, from Tampa Bay, Florida. He graduated from Florida University, Roman Catholic. It sounds like in about his early 30s. And he is involved in trying to get these people out of Santa Maria. Once in, it is a tight net. It's tied around you. It's very hard for somebody to get out of it once you're in. But um, uh, when I go down to Los Angeles, uh, I'll pick up a telephone book, a Yellow Pages, and I'll turn to uh, Botanica, or I turn to Pet Store. Pet Store. And then you'll find out how many, how large, uh, how influential Santa Rita is in the San Fernando Valley. I live in the north end of it. Uh, by seeing how many uh, botanicas and pet stores there are. Pet stores is where you go to buy your animals for your sacrifices. And the botanicas, the extensive stores where you buy all the things that are necessary to feed and to celebrate the Orishas. It's a big business. Um, so, uh, it originally was Afro-American, Hispanic-American, but now it's moved into the middle class. It is the stealth religion of all stealth religions. They don't like to be known. They do not want to be known. Um, uh, they've stopped putting their animal sacrifices on the crossroads in places like Miami. Miami used to spend, have to spend a lot of money every morning going out to the Pacific Vortex, as the spiritual locations and pick up the dead animals before the tourists arrive to see them. So they've stopped doing that, and, but, so they're growing in now to uh, the American middle class. It's become quite a phenomenon. So we're looking at, um, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, the shamanism and so on. Um, now there is a concept, there's a concept <coughs> That is, that buoys up all of this. Uh, and that's the concept of the soul. Soul, the concept of the soul. Which is an, uh, an underpinning concept of all of these, of all of these religions. The idea of the, is the soul is something you, that you have this in you. Okay, you have a soul. That's the underpinning. That comes, merges directly out of anim, animism, right? Very simple to trace. If you, there's a soul. <clears throat> and many, a couple of millenniums ago, the idea was that the soul pre existed, it dwelt the body, and then transmigrated out of the body. Okay. Uh, it, um, is part and parcel of ancient Greek dualism. The concept that you possess this soul. That is over here, and then it's here, and then when you die, it goes someplace else. Um, you're probably aware that uh, the Aryans, people from what you might say the Persians and so on, took it to northern India about 1000 uh, BC and interconnected with the monistic ancient Vedas that were, were the religion of India at that time collided and out of the collision you developed the, dharm, uh, the doctrines of karma and reincarnation. Um, but it was the concept of the soul that moves shamanism and makes possible the soul journey. You leave and you go someplace else to Someplace that uh, is hard to identify. Um, some people have a hard time believing, and I did too, uh, that 
you know, I'm a Christian pastor, that the Bible does not teach that we have a soul. What happened in the 4th and 5th centuries, A.D., uh, there was a Greek revival, sometimes called neo aristotelianism but more properly Neoplatonism. And it was a time when the Roman Empire was falling apart, and the people were blaming them that gods haven't been worshipped. We have to get back to the real worship of the gods, you know, these people are overwhelming our empire. And so there was a revival of Greek dualism, and the concept of this soul came in to Christianity at that point. Augustine bought it. Um, Aquinas later in the Summa Theologica in the 15th century wrote it into the official doctrine. And so Christians have long held that idea that we have a soul. But, unfortunately, it's not a biblical notion. Um, the Greek word is nephish, means living being. We don't, we don't have a soul or our soul, we are a living being. In the Greek New Testament, it's the word suke, we get a word psychology from it. It means the same thing. We are a living being. That's essentially what it is. But I would say about 75% of Christians <clears throat> still retain that, that ancient version idea of the soul. And when I first encountered it in the 1960s, when I went to my first foray into a seminary, <clears throat> I was shocked. I thought, all these people are terrible liberals. What are they getting this crap? You know. <laughs> and, uh, but eventually I figured it out. Oh, they were, that's correct. You know, you just, what you do is you, you trace theology. Every doctrine of theology has a history to it. And all the books you can get on where this stuff came from, it's easily traceable. And so I did. I said, I want to find out for myself. So I traced it back to the emergency times of the Roman Empire. When they thought our empire is going to fall apart, we've got to get back to the real worship of the gods. And uh, so they rediscovered the soul, which has informed so many of the pagan and now the neo-pagan uh, religion. Some of them have more than one soul. And we're going to be reading about the Hmong religion that has up to 19 to 30 souls. And if you lose any one of them, you get sick. That's true. And the shaman goes, retrieves, and, and heals that soul. Uh, yeah, in shamanism, the general idea is you, you're born with at least one guardian when you're born. And some say two. Some say as many as seven. You have, you know, it's not an organized thing. You have all kinds of different sort of things. I'm going to stop right there. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to stop right here and um, see if you got, you know, please disagree with me. You know, it's okay. You you can, you don't have to believe a word I say. It's, this is education. You know, you're looking, you know, we're, we're never threatened by information that, doesn't settle well with us. One of the best ways to learn is to figure out another point of view and evaluate it, and apply critical analysis to it. And uh, we were informed at least about what we, well, I don't believe that. That, that guy, Phil Pod showed up and boy, talking about himself, that's wrong. Okay, well, you've, you, you've got some new information. You don't always have to agree with it. And it's in the, sometimes in the disagreeing in the conversation that we learned the most. So, anybody got anything you want to ask or comment on it so far? Uh, what exactly makes uh, Santeria like a noose? Like, once they get into it, like, what makes it so hard to, I guess, leave? What aspects of it? It becomes all encompassing uh, in that um, almost common decisions need divination, the, the throwing of the cowrie shells. Uh, by a Baba Loa or by a Santero or Santera. You get to the point where you don't have that capacity to function on your own. You're, you're captive to the fortune teller. Uh, and they cost. Uh, this fellow, Michael Mendez, who called me yesterday on the phone, uh, he was saying, 
what a terrible financial burden is borne by these people that he knows in the Tampa Bay area because of the high cost of doing the religion. They demand so much money, a couple of hundred, three hundred dollars to throw the cowrie shells, or like tarot cards, they'll use tarot cards and a bunch of different things. Um, and just, you, you get to the point where you become unable to make your own decision about certain things. And so you go, uh, you go to the, your house, your house godfather, your house godmother, and, and it becomes your life. It, um, there are ceremonies that go on throughout the day, beginning in the morning, ending at night, the constant feeding. Of, of the Orishas, you're sitting in a little crockery pot, a little stone, it's called an Otain, and you have to feed it on a periodic basis. Uh, Sounds to me like there's fear. Superstition is based on, on fear. There's a superstitious element that you feel powerless, that the power belongs with the Santero, the Santera, or the Babala, oh, they're supposed to be the specialists in the divination. So that's, that's one element. <clears throat> but you live in a whole community where everybody's doing this. Pretty much everybody's involved. I mean, you're not going to get away much getting out of it. it um, Santa Rio won't have a great deal of penetration um, outside of that community. But once you're there, you're there. So it's, both, it's partially social and partially, partially psychological, and e uh, your finances are involved too. The psychology of the fear that you cannot live outside of that society, you will lose all the people you know, you will lose uh, your protection spiritually, your protection. And so that's pretty potent stuff to answer the question. Why plus, it's difficult to leave. Plus, it's the it's the best show in town too. Uh, you know, it's uh, the bembies and the, the bata and the, the tambour, the the drumming and the dancing and uh, basically getting uh, drunk, stoned, and loaded uh, and carrying on all night. <laughs> you know, it's it's what goes on in in the community. It's it's the fun. But they, it's all built into the, the, the religious structure. There's more to it, I'm sure, than that. But thank you. But those are those are part. You know, we were we we're discussing. You know, what a cult is. There's two ways of looking at a cult. I just mentioned real briefly because it maybe you've helped. Because what, what you're really talking about is a, a cultic element that keeps a person there. Um, one, a, a religious way of looking at a cult is, for example, let's say in Christianity, uh, Arius in the 4th century, uh, a British monk, he denied the deity of Christ. Uh, and <clears throat> that produced a real crisis. And the era, it was what we would call a heresy. And so he developed a group of followers, and that persisted for a couple of hundred years, called the Arian Controversy. Those people that followed that would have been called a cult, okay? Because a major, a major essential doctrine was denied, so the people that embraced that left and formed a separate group. That would be a good definition of a cult. Now. Uh, there's a better definition of a cult, um, and that is examining a group in the, on the basis of recruitment, motivation, and retention. The people who, who do this stuff, when I did a doctorate, my major professor was, was a guy that was a major guy in the nation on this, Lou Rambo, still is. Rambo. <laughs> Great guy. And uh, so... Not that Rambo. He, what it is, it breaks down like this. There's four areas of cults. The religious, the political, the economic, and the educational slash therapeutic. So what you do is you look at a group, and you examine how they recruit people. Is there full disclosure? 
do they hide certain things? You have to have a, a, a stages of initiation before you're told like the inner secrets um, recruitment. You're not, you're not out front. It's not all clear in the literature or what you've been told. Um, there's other forms of recruitment that can be used. It was a big group, the Jesus People Movement, a group called the Children of God, and they used a little technique called love bombing. Um, if it was a guy, all these ladies would just love bomb you. Yeah, the best, you know, they just they were with you. Going, oh, you know, they love bomb you. Oh, yeah, I want to, I want to be with these girls. And then the guys did the same thing to the girls. Love, we called love bombing and passed into uh, probably in, in the dictionary now. A recruitment technique. In other words, the person of, didn't join of his own free will. They got roped into it, tricked into it, lied into it one way or another. So that's, that's recruitment. Motivation is, how do you keep people motivated going? Well, offer them positions of power, you move up in the structure. Uh, financial money, prestige, an office, some garments that are special. There's all kinds of ways of motivating somebody. In Amway, one of the economic cults is a big paycheck. Or more people under you and you get more money siphoned up to you. Uh, so that's, that's motivation. Retention is, all, it could be very, all, all kinds of, that's, that's where it gets interesting. Bullying, all kinds of strange psychological and physical bullying, um, threatened lawsuits, shunning, rejection, loss of job, loss of income, loss of fellowship, family. So these are a way that from a secular point of view, you take a look at a group and analyze it to see whether it had those cultic elements or not. Okay. Is it just those three, recruitment, motivation, and retention? Yes, that's okay. it. So that's, that's the way the, the, the cultic thing goes. Um, now I want to get to a more serious side of this. Um, this is this is book by I don't know if you know anybody know the name of Diana Paxson, Berkeley. She's one of the leading Wiccan Wiccans in America. Mm -hmm. And when her book. Joey was here. She mentioned Diana Paxson. Um, I've I've had email correspondence with her, and um, it's called Transportation. This book is just called Trans. If you have a book on Wicca or a book on shamanism. There will be pages and pages about how to move into a trance state. Synonyms for trance states are passive state of mind, altered state of consciousness. What was the other one? See, trance, passive, altered state of consciousness. I think there's something else. Um, Michael Harner uh, distinguishes between, he just has two categories, the SSC, the shamanic state of consciousness, and the OSC, the ordinary state of consciousness. Right now, I think everyone's in the ordinary state of consciousness. We're in the ordinary state of consciousness. We're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but the shaman can move into, the shaman can move into the trance state, or the ecstasy, that's the other word I wanted, ecstasy. Ecstasy is, comes from a Greek word, means to stand outside of yourself. Ah, interesting. To stand outside of yourself. So all of these things, particularly shamanism and Wicca, and another thing I'm going to introduce to you now, charisma, depend upon the trance state. I'm not making this up. I mean, it's the literature is full of it. The trance state. That's in your. It's in your. Um, it's in your textbook. The altered state of consciousness. The ASC. So, how is this done? How do you move into that? And there's all kinds of formulas and mechanisms for, for doing that. Uh, the Santerian, um, when they become possessed of their Orisha and start telling fortunes and giving advice, 
Um, they've got the Bata drummers, at least three. Skilled. If, you if you've never heard it, you can hear it on go into uh, YouTube, type in um, Santa Rea drumming or Bembe, B E M B E. It's excellent West African Afro Cuban oh. drumming. It's excellent. It's gone, it's stunning. You, you can hear it tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, they combine that. They combine that with the dancing and the chanting. And a lot of times before that, they drink tobacco juice. Oh. Wonderful stuff. <laughs> Yum. But it's hallucinogenic. Oh, the reason is, is because, remember, animism, everything's got life in it. Well, they believe that the tobacco leaves, of course, have life in them. And if you boil them down, distill, uh, let it settle a little bit, and you drink that juice, you're you're drinking energy into yourself. You're getting this energy in it. There you go, get a little energy. <laughs> so, so they have these ways of moving into into these altered states of consciousness. Um, has anybody read a book on on how to get in a, a wicked book about how to get into into an altered state of consciousness? Well, they're, they're by the pages. I've, I've read them one after the other. They're very similar. Let's see if I can do it. Uh, you know, it starts with uh, uh, deep breathing, set, getting yourself in a nice, settled place where you feel comfortable. Maybe uh, turning down the lights, um, focusing on maybe an object, um, start some concentration or focusing or visualization verse, words for the, virtually the same thing. And then, chief among them, expect this event to take place. Expect it. Don't doubt it. Just expect it. Let it come. Let it happen. Um, mood music, um, uh, you can go into, where I bought this store, and uh, my wife and I were back in West Virginia a few weeks ago, and in Shepherdstown, where Shepherdstown University is, I found this this book, and I've been wanting to get Harner's book for a long time, and there it was. But they have a whole shelf of music CDs just for helping you get into the trance state. Right there. Whole right there. music industry. Huh? Whole music industry. Whole it's a whole industry built around how it is that an individual can move into the trance state. Now there's a couple, there's interesting couple ideas here. Okay, so these, all of these depend upon the transit. Now I'm gonna, I, remember I mentioned charisma sounds Christian, doesn't it? In Christianity, on the far left, far right, you have what's called charisma, or sometimes called mysticism. Um, books on Wicca and shamanism will mention charisma. Because they like to say, well, we're not doing anything different than the Christians are doing. Look at them. You know, we call it the 7-Eleven. They're saying seven words 11 times to the beat of the drum and the band. And, <clears throat> and so they move into a light, a medium, or deep trance state. I was shocked when I found in a book on Wicca where they were authenticating their practice by saying, see, this is, the Christians are doing the same thing we're doing. We're not doing anything else. They're going, they're going to a trance state. Okay, that's what I call the far right. It's, it's in part of Christianity we call Pentecostalism. I used to be one. A while, I have a couple of things I've written. I refer to myself as a wild-eyed Pentecostal, and I was one. Um, I pastored a Pentecostal church for ten years. And speaking in tongues? Speaking in tongues, yes, I did that. Uh, as a hippie in the Hay Ashbury. So, on the far left are the are the mystics, and books on Wicca and shamanism will also note the mystics. Uh, have you ever heard of Saint John of the Cross? Um, St. Teresa of Avila, Ignatius Loyola, Julian of Norwich. Uh, these are just some of dozens of uh, Christian mystics 
um, who follow the pattern of people like Anthony and Benedict, who would go away into the desert, into the cave, and they would contemplate their navel for weeks on end. Uh, and they would start to experience the trance state. In the trance state, and here I'm going to get to the most controversial and probably the most vital issue of all, is the trance state you can move into. You can do that. But anybody heard of Ayahuasca? Oh, the, uh, the drug. The drug. Every once in a while, you've so you been reading a chronicle that somebody has gone down to South America to get that drug that produces the hallucinations and they die from it. They'll go to that extreme. It's a very potent drug um, distilled essentially from plants that are peculiar to a particular area of the tropic of the rainforest. And um, so, so the trance. So you're in the trance. Now here's the whole deal. What happens in the trance? What goes on? Um, we're talking about what happens in the trance. You didn't miss the, the central deal is, is, is coming up right here. And this is the issue that I'm constantly struggling with. What happens in that? Is it real? Is it real? In my, my new book, it's called Wicca, in my chapter on Wicca, it says, Wicca, is it real? Is it real? And, and that's, that's the issue. Are we just playing games? It's a fantasy land. Is it just sort of fun hanging out with the folks? Or is there actually something going on? Even Harner will equivocate. Diana Paxson stopped communicating with me. Uh, when I finally asked her, she was very patient up to that time, I said, does what happen, happen to you when you go on these soul journeys? When you arrive and your, your spirit animal meets you, your coyote, or maybe an eagle, or maybe a bear, or another special helper, like, you know, you've read the Iceland book, I've read that too. Uh, maybe an elf, or a fairy, or who knows what else accompany you and they, they, or guardian angel, and they take you on the journey. They go with you on the journey. Did you really go on a journey? Where did that journey take place? When I asked Diana Paxson, she stopped communicating with me. She would, that was the last email. And I tried to, I went a little time to why I tried again, she refused to communicate with me. Because she knew I had landed on the real thing. What happened? Are you guys crazy? Is this really happening? Book after book after book in an occult bookshop are simply records or journals of somebody's conversations with some deity someplace or another while they were on a journey. They're by the dozens. By the dozens. There's, there's one called Jesus Calling uh, that uh, has sold 9 million copies in the last five years. Mm -hmm. Huh? Have you heard of it? <clears throat> You've heard of uh, Course in Miracles, Helen Schuchman. Jesus talks to her and she writes everything down and a, a major cult is born out of it and it's growing. What happens? Is somebody really talking to you? Or are you imagining this? Are you really being transported by your animal helper into heaven? Are you actually going down and having a peek at hell? See, that's the issue. It's what's taking place. Um, and you can't, as far as I've read, and I've read a lot in this area, I have not found anybody who will say one way or another. It will, usually says, it's just in my head, just in my head, Or it happens out here for real in some kind of reality. An out-of-body experience? An out-of-body experience. That you're actually on a journey. You've heard of astral travel. It was big, big in the hate ashbury Okay. That was going into a trance and traveling. 
And you'd see all kinds of stuff. I knew lots of people who astral traveled. I used to visit them in the locked ward at Marin General Hospital. <laughs> I did. That's serious. And they, a, lot of, a lot of people lost their minds on that. Um, but, so, I don't know what happens. I don't know what happens. When the Hmong shamans go on their journey, they have a landscape that they follow. And they have a horse that takes them on this journey. They have, they're prepared with certain weapons. They go to a mountain that is part of their cultural landscape that they expect to go to. They don't go to heaven or hell. Because that's not part of their culture. They go on a particular long journey. So, so the issue is, What's going on? Is it, is it just fantasy? Or is there reality to it? I'm going to give you my opinion. Almost guaranteed to disagree with it. It's okay. My opinion is that they are actually going on a journey. It's for real. It is actual. But it's taking place here. Taking place here. It's taking place here. It, it, it is not a separate outside the body experience. It's right here. Um, that's one of the one of the issues. But now the second issue, and the more important one, and then we shut up. What are they being? What are they encountering? What is it? Are, is this the spirit of a, of a coyote, an eagle, a bear? Is that really what it is? Is it the spirit or soul of a dead ancestor? Is that really what they're doing? Is it a fairy? Is it an elf? Is it the god Apollo? Is it the goddess Venus? very common helpers on the journey in Wicca. Is it Thor? You know, the old pagan religions have been brought into the new age. That's what we call it, neo-pagan. The old Greco-Roman gods have been, all of a sudden, here they are again! And you too can talk with them. Whatever your culture is, that's yeah. the names of them. Yeah. Because that's what you have in your mind. And if you're journeying in your mind, that's what you have in your mind. So that's what you have. So are you really talking to Thor? <laughs> Is that actual great-grandpa Eddie? What is that? What are you doing? Now here's, here's what I'm going to tell you what I think it is. I believe that they are encountering something genuine. If they didn't, they would not be so captivated, and this is, I'm going to go back to this a little bit. What holds people there? Uh, I, read, I read some stunning material by some very well-educated people uh, that did not belong to a culture that traditionally was into that stuff. And yet they bought the whole thing and became evangelists for it. Everybody ought to be one. Something dramatic and real happens. You encounter spirit. And you'll change from being a materialist to being a spiritualist. It is so powerful and so real. And it is very alluring and it is very addicting. We started the class with uh, unexplainable experiences that people have had that they cannot deny. They might repress them, but they can't deny them because they experienced them. Right. So this, this is all real, and it actually does happen. But what are they? They are demonic spirits. I see them feel 
Now we get to the Christian worldview. Yeah. And why so many people are doing it then? If it's What's that? Why is so many people like wanting to go into that state or to, wanting to, to do that if it's demonic spirits? You know? Because they, they know if it's demonic spirits or they don't know. They, they many times don't encounter anything that appears evil. Um, I have a, a guy I work out with at a gym. I won't give you his name, but he's one of the America's foremost Zen Buddhist priests. He runs the Green Gulch Zen Center, very close to where John and Christina live. Um, and my wife and I spent a couple of hours with Reb, and I've known him for years. Uh, and he knows I work in this area, and I, I asked him, I said, when you go into your trances, do you ever encounter beings that are dangerous, that are evil? He says, oh, yes, oh, yes. We are taught, and he says, and I teach my pupils how to avoid them, and there are various techniques that they use to avoid being harmed by these, these spirits. The Wiccans are very well aware of these. The shamans are very well aware of these. The Santeria priests and priestesses are very well aware of these. They know they're there, and they have various ways of, they think, avoiding them. So they think they can distinguish between the dangerous ones and the right. uh, bene benevolent ones. Right. They may, but, but all that they encounter is essentially evil that is dressed up to look good. Uh, they are sometimes called <laughs> familiar spirits. They look like maybe great grandpa Eddie. Uh, they look like a real coyote or a deer or an eagle. And it does not seem that way. It does not seem that it's evil and demonic. Yeah? Who's to say that these spirits aren't God disguised as something that is comfortable to that person, and that's why that's who they see instead of a divine being made of light? You know? Like, how do you, how do you know what God looks like? How do you know what God decides to, to present himself as to each individual person? You know? I do. Um, and that's a, that's a good question, and um, I'm going to provide the best answer I can for you here. Um, I have, this is going to, it's going to occur on three different levels. Uh, one, biblical material, where we find in the scripture abundant information that there are unclean spirits. Paul said, he, he said, sometimes they'll even appear like angels of light. Um, and that they are able, I'm going to get to just a second, let me get these three and we'll go back. Um, so we find in the scripture, um, material written over in two different cultures, three different languages over a period of 1,500 years, very similar experiences. Uh, Jesus was very clear that um, there are such a clever counterfeit that it's very difficult to see what's unclean and what's not. Um, so, secondly, you have the biblical, you have the biblical material, okay, but secondly, you have, unfortunately, somebody like me, who, and don't gasp too much, that I have engaged for many, many years, particularly during the 70s and the 80s, I've written three books in the area, Manual of Demonology and Cult of the Deliverance book, how Christians cast out demons, and if the devil wrote a Bible. I, this is one of my areas of expertise. I literally engaged in what you call exorcism for many, many years, and it's just something that you find out about. Okay. Um, there's also the testimony of people who have left those groups, who have left those groups, and who will say, what I thought was turned out not to be. There is a point at which, you never once in a while I have some of these people call me and want to come and talk, that maybe for 20 years they were very comfortable with whatever spirit it was, whatever entity it was that was constantly talking to them, who was doing tricks for them, and so on. But then it 
changed. Then it got weird. And they finally had an idea of what this really was. My wife and I just did this two, three weeks ago with the person who had been caught up into this for a couple of decades. She finally figured out what was going on and she said, I think this is it. What do you think? So I, I have several levels of looking at it, um, and from my personal experience and how I understand it, that <clears throat> there are, there's a very clever counterfeit that goes on in these various religious groups. I'm not the only one that says this. There's hundreds of people who look at this who would, who would, who would say the same thing as I'm saying. I know that it's startling. I know that it doesn't fit in to most people's worldview, but nevertheless, I see what I see, and so you, you have my experience and my, my evaluation. Um, so I had the original question of, so you're saying that a lot of what gives you your worldview is through biblical texts, but aren't most biblical texts also written by people, so how do you, what makes them right? Yeah, how do you know they weren't in a trance and they just spot, did word vomit onto a, a book and that's where the Bible came from? Like, how do you, how do you know that? Like, it wasn't just their opinion, yeah. I guess would be a better way of asking that. And then, like, the, the question that developed from what you said was, how do you know the difference between schizophrenia and possession? Like, how can you tell someone doesn't have a mental disorder, but they actually have a demon inside them. Like, what makes you think one versus the other? And do you ever think, do you think schizophrenia is even real? This, this, that's a very good question. I'll be glad to deal with that. Um, I always thought that I was a little bit psychotic myself sometimes. <laughs> but, um, I want to get to this one and come back to this. My, my background is psychology. I ran a counseling center for 10 years. and um, I, love, I love psychology and I love that sort of thing. And diagnosing best we can. Um, the, there's, there's no objective mechanism or, or means by which you can say uh, that, you know, oh, this is, this is the truth or it's not the truth. There, there's no way to do that. Um, what happens for most of us, and people like me, um, I became a Christian. I was 21 years old. I was a junior at UC Davis in psychology. And when I encountered the whole Christian thing, I thought it was ridiculous. I never read any piece of the Bible. When I tried to read it, I thought, this is ridiculous. And I remember throwing the Bible across the room one day. The only time I ever read any. I was raised Christian, so I know the but, Bible. But what happens is, over time, in your exposure to it, you begin to see, oh, well, the different I thought it was. This matches up to my reality. This, what, what, what Jesus said in the Gospels, what Paul, what John, oh, okay, I resonate with that. I understand that. I see that that's, that that's correct. And it, it sort of comes like that for us. There's nothing that says, oh, you know, sign appears, yeah, this is it. It's sort of something that you experience over a period of time. It doesn't come quickly. Um, and um, so getting to this position, this thing, the trans state, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why people will equivocate as to whether when I say, does this happen in your head or outside of your head, so a little bit reluctant to answer because they don't want to appear like wackos. Nobody does. Schizophrenia, separation from from ordinary reality is different than going on a soul journey. You're there. My brother came back from Vietnam schizophrenic and he killed himself about one month after he got back. And I visited him in Presidio Hospital and he was there and he was in the mental ward and it was very obvious to me my brother had broken. He had crossed a line into unreality and despite medication and treatment that he'd had in Japan and Hawaii before he came back to the States, he was unable to come back to that place. 
So schizophrenia would have had a trigger, and you're saying people that might be possessed have a trigger, they just have... I, I'm, I'm not quite following that. Well, okay, so I understand you're saying that he had reason for being schizophrenic. So are you saying that how you determine the difference is because people who have no reason to be schizophrenic must no. be possessed? You know, we did, you did distinguish between neurosis and psychosis. Psychosis is a place where you cross a line. I, have you ever felt, have you ever felt, I've had a couple times in my life, desperate times, where you felt, I could just let myself go and drift into a, a place that was maybe safer, felt safer. That's a lot of times what people will describe as they went into this, this space, and all of a sudden they were living in a separate reality. That's what schizo, the schizo personality means. And, and you can't come back. You don't come back. Um, there's no retreatment for schizophrenia. It, it's managed. You manage schizophrenia. Neurosis, anxiety. Um, hey, I'm a writer. <laughs> I <laughs> When I was a teenager, I was a hypochondriac. I get out of the stuff by stomach aches and headaches. A friend of mine pointed out, Philpott, you're a hypochondriac. I looked it up and I said, Yep, I am one. That's why I went into psychology. <laughs> you know, I, I've always struggled with a certain amount of anxiety. I get a little, little hepped up, my wife will tell you. And I'm, I get a little bit weird when I, when I do that. But, I'm, I'm most of the time within reality. But schizophrenia, you're not. You, it's, it's not a journey that you're going on in a trance. It's, it's, a, it's a state that, um, that is, is difficult. I, I want to get to you, and she had another question. <laughs> so I'm wondering, you said that when you became a Christian, you looked at the word in the Bible and you knew in your heart that it was right. Like it resonated with you, right? You said it resonated with gradually. you. Gradually. Gradually. Yes. Gradually re resonated with you. Yeah, at first you don't know what this document is. You see everybody's using it, you know, your church is there in the pew, but you don't know really what it is and it's a sort of a slow interaction with it. That makes sense. Yeah. So, from your view, that is what is true, but... From another person's view, like a Wicca or some anybody that studies a different religion, I'm sure that they feel the same way. So who's to say what's right and what's wrong, what's reality and what's not, which which if these are demons or if that's really God, you know? Well, like, the, I'm having trouble like coming to terms with you telling me that the other religions that have these trance states that witness spirit beings that they believe to be divine beings are not actually be divine beings; they're demons. Like how how I'm, I'm just... Well, I know that there's a certain pop way of looking at things that says, well, whatever is true for you is true. And to a certain degree, that is accurate, isn't it? Because you're living with that. But, is it objective truth? Uh, when you look at the world's religions, um, they are fundamentally different from one another. They really are different. Hinduism and Buddhism, based on monism, there's only one single reality, given many names. Um, Christianity has a completely different worldview. Both cannot be true at once. If we're going to deal in, in reality, the, the difficulty in, is staying in reality. That, that's a job, staying in reality and not moving away from it. But once you embrace the concept that whatever is true for you is true for you, it's true. I have my truth. Even though they are, are really in opposition, there's a bit of a disconnect there. Just how much truth is everybody truth, true? There is a subjective nature in which that's true. But it objectively, we're dealing with absolute reality. We have to be careful about... A little, a little too much open-mindedness, a little bit too much tolerance. Because then you're, you're moving into a very strange place. And, and you lose the capacity to say anything defini def definitively. You lose the capacity to say right and wrong.
good or bad? Do you lose that now? It's all good. You lose that. Um, yes. Oh, um, I was just, uh, so you're saying that, like, those who are schizophrenic cannot come back, whereas those who go on these journeys are able to leave reality and then come back to reality. That may be one way of distinguishing. Um, now, <clears throat> there are psychotropic but, but drugs. Are talking about the trance state, uh, the SS, uh, shamanic? Shamanic. Uh, state of state consciousness. Of consciousness, and then the ordinary state of consciousness, and that's similar to what you just said. Mm -hmm. Coming back, a person who is schizophrenic doesn't always live in unreality, mm -hmm. but a condition is developed that is very hard for them. But we've, there's a number of treatments that people are getting better and better at, at this, and and now most people who have no fault of their own, circumstantial mm -hmm. things happen in people's lives moves them into this very strange place, but they, they can be re, uh, treated. I know a number of people who are obviously schizophrenic who, who live perfectly normal lives. So it's, it's not like a done deal, you know, uh, medical science has really done a lot of work in this area. So I'm solving a, a little bit of a hard time just understanding how you determine that someone is possessed, because Somebody is what? That someone would be possessed. Because people hear voices all the time. Well, not all the time. But there are people who hear voices, and those voices don't talk to them all the time. And sometimes their telephone is telling them to go do stuff, but no one's on the other end. Is that possession? Like, I'm not understanding what you would care. Like, what are your checkpoints? Like, okay, this, this, this. Okay, you're possessed. Like, I don't know. Well, okay, I'm going to tell you something a little funny because I don't know the answer to that. I have no, I, well, I would say, I have no answer to that, and I'll, I'll come to you, and I think you had something along that same line, huh? Um, now, this will, this will really sound weird to you now. I don't really know. But there is a way of finding out. You ready for this? If there's a demonic spirit there, they'll tell me. I'll command them in the name of Jesus to tell me who they are. Here's the interesting thing. This is why. This is why it's not, it's, it's it's really very serious. You'll be surprised. In all the religious literature, there's only one individual who has power and authority over unclean spirits. Guess who? Guess who I said. And you, if you read through any of the Gospels, you'll find that that's so. It's been through all the way through. Um, back in the 80s, there was an elderly, retired Catholic priest, pretty tall guy, about 6'8". Six, six, guy as old as I am now. And uh, he was the exorcist for the Archdiocese of San Francisco. And he read one of my books. So he called me up. And uh, he said, uh, uh, can I come talk to you? So he came to my office in San Rafael, um, and Mill Valley at then. And we talked, and he said, I would like, to, would you come with me sometime? I said, sure. So he would call me up on the hard cases. And we would go do this. And we would sit down with some people that I had never seen before, all over the Bay Area here, some down in the South Bay. Um, not out in this area, I don't think. And I would sit there, I didn't know what's going on, you know who these people are. But I would, and I know it sounds strange, and it's, it's okay to think I'm nuts, I probably partially am. I would command a spirit in the name of Jesus to tell me who they are, and then tell them to get out. And I've actually done that thousands of times, thousands of times. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Somehow this got into a Time Magazine article, or a Life Magazine article. And I got a call from Time Magazine, a woman named Nancy, a reporter who lived in Green Bay on Spike Mass Hill. And she said, you really do this? Christina served the story, I think. I said, well, no. She said, can I come with you? I said, okay. I picked her up. 
went up to Nevada where we had a place where we did this. And, um, and so we were in this place, I won't describe it too long, we were in this little upstairs garage. My, my good friend Mark Buckley and was here. I was here, Mark was here, the person, the guy I'd never seen before, a guy about the same age as I was then. And this, and Nancy, here's your reporter, she's got her notebook out. And um, I didn't have a chance to talk to the guy, knew nothing, but it was something we did on this particular night, every night of the week. I would come up there, and Mark and I would do this. People would come from all over. So we're sitting there, and we're commanding a demon to come out. And this guy sat there as cool as a cucumber. And that was cold. There was no heating. It was cold. And this is going on half hour, 45 minutes. Mark and I are sweating. And this, this young lady, reporter from Time, very intimidating, she's taking notes and looking. Yeah, this, is, this is a bunch of bull here. <laughs> and we're getting nervous. This is bad. This is looking bad. We're feeling like fools. So we're there, and this guy, about from here to the wall, let's say the, the ceiling was not finished, there was nothing on there, it was just studs on the wall. This guy all of a sudden flies backwards, up against the wall, comes all the way down and slides down on his butt, right over there. Mark and I go get him, put him back in the chair, we do it again, same thing happens. Boom! We decide that's enough. So we went over, and, and within a, a period of very short time, several demons were cast out of him. We did it until they stopped what we call manifesting, or stopped, show, started, stopped showing up. And a, a young lady come, come up, and so we did the same thing, but it was very typical, it was very simple and quick. I took her back, Nancy, within a few days the, the magazine came out, and I, it wasn't there, the account wasn't there, it, wasn't, it was missing. I called her up and I said, what happened? And she says, I submitted the story just like it happened. My editor said it's unbelievable and deleted it. I said, okay. But I had, I've had hundreds of those kinds of events happen. Now when you see it hundreds and hundreds of times over decades, you begin to get the idea, oh, I would have it happen many times. I'm driving back or coming home or I'm talking to somebody and I say, Phil Bob, did that really happen? It seemed so unreal, but yet it did. It's it happened. And over and over and over again, because of a book that I wrote, people descended on us in Marin County for years, and we had to develop all kinds of teams of people to do it because it was overwhelming them. My family got sick and tired of these people showing up at my door and at my office. It was awful. And but I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is I've had so many experiences and so many with me have had the identical experience of this kind of thing. And after a while, you finally get it. Hmm. So the first was biblical accounts. The second was your account of your experiences. And I forget the third. I can't even. Oh. I don't know. Maybe somebody can say. Uh, the people who had been in these groups who had come oh, that's out. Oh, the right. people, yeah. yes. Yeah, Other people's right. accounts have been... Yeah, they, and, that's, and that's probably the most important thing I should have emphasized. That people will finally wake up to what they actually are in touch with. They're astonished at it. They're frightened by it. They're ashamed. They're humiliated by it. To think that all these years they've been doing this... And now it turns out to be this. If these other cultures have no knowledge of Christianity, they can't differentiate that. They can't say, well, this is a demon if they have not, if that's not part of their culture. Oh, good they, point. If, they, if God is not part, if Christian God is not part of their religion, they can't sit there and say, oh, it must be a demon. If that doesn't have any relation to the culture because it's alien to them. Right. You know, that, that sounds reasonable. But there's, yeah. a couple, there's a couple things I would say to that. Um, Particularly in, in today's world, there's probably not a culture that hasn't been impacted by Christianity to some degree. Uh, in, in our little congregation, we have several Muslims um, who were raised in Muslim countries and were aware of all of these things. 
So there's, there's a penetration that, that occurs it, despite that. Um, and so they might have some, but more particularly, I think, and more apropos to your question, I think, is that what starts out to be a benign helping, let's say, spirit animal. And miracles. Pardon? And miracles. Yes, but I, I was going someplace else, Christina. Okay. <laughs> they, they find that these are not as wonderful creatures as they thought, and they move into a place where they become terrified of them. Now this happens to them. Then they go to the Patrino, or the Madrino, or they go to somebody, and they're, they're actually, in their experience, in their journey, they become frightened. That they experience that these that case? start out to be good, turn to be bad. They didn't. What's that? Does that happen in every case? Because in the movies no. we've watched, I don't, I don't think so. I would have no way of really, really saying. But I know that it does happen to some people. I know that it has happened to some people. I've read their accounts. What actually happens to a person that is actually possessed by a bad demon? I mean, and then you're faced with them, with that person. Like, what do they do anything? I mean, all we get, I guess, where I get it from is like, you know, the movies and stuff, but you know, that's movies. But in reality, like, when you see a person that's possessed, I mean, are they close to what it's like in the movies, or is it different? Is it, you know, I mean, how can you... Do you're they really look normal, do you mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they look normal, or... They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't seem unusual. Um, it, um, it, it's... It's a life chaotic that... I mean, how do they know, like, you know, if they seem normal, like, you know, I'm yeah, normal, I'm possessed, or what makes them, yeah, or, I don't know. Is their life chaotic? That was or interesting. Well, is it, is it demonic spirits give gifts. They are very, they are gift givers. Um, they um, will bring you all kinds of things that appear to be good. Uh, have you ever heard of the Faustian exchange? Oh, you ever read that? The in Faustian bargain. Right? Yes, the Faustian bargain, where the, the person sells his soul to the devil, and he says, "Oh, and I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this." Well, but he loses big time at the end. It, it turns wormy. It turns. It turns <laughs> awful. In in time, I I could tell you some stories that would demonstrate that, but I'm really a, a little afraid to do this. But it actually occurs that what what starts out being wonderful and giving, even loving, in, in Wicca, many of of, uh, of the people, they, they take lovers as their guardian spirit. Um, the it's 415, that's why we're experiencing the uh, crew that are leaving. The exodus. Okay, I, I'll talk to you personally sure. if you want. Those who, who need to leave can leave. Those who would like to stay can stay. As we've done before. Where are the uh, quick weapons? Right here. Do you actually feel the